Welcome to today's VitoDens 100 B1HA, B1KA wiring, control interface, and basic programming for startup online seminar. My name is Miranda Getling, and I'm the Wiesman Academy Manager here in the U.S., and I just wanted to take this opportunity to say thank you for attending, and we appreciate you taking the time out to attend today's seminar. I also want to give an opportunity to introduce you to your instructor today. For those that may not know him, his name is Jay Sheldon, and Jay has been with Wiesman for the last five years. In the first three years, he was a member of the Technical Service Department before moving into his current role as the Academy Training Instructor. Jay has a master license, has been in the heating and cooling industry for the past 30 years, including holding job titles as general manager, service manager, and owner of his own company for 14 of those years. And before Jay begins, we do have a few housekeeping items to go over. And the first one is, is that you will stay muted throughout the entire seminar. However, at the bottom of your screen, you will see a Q&A button. If you simply click on this button, a a pop-up will pop up and you'll be able to type in any questions you have throughout the entire seminar. Jay has a couple of presentations he'll be going over today and he'll stop in between about halfway through each of them and at the end to answer any questions submitted. So feel free to type them in at any time. We will also be putting together a spreadsheet of all of the questions asked today and all of the associated answers that we will send out to you in spreadsheet form. So you will have those post seminar as well. So feel free to put them in there, like I said, at any time. We are recording today's seminar, and the seminar will be posted on our wiesman-usacademy.com website in our video library section. And once you're on that website, there's two ways to get to that video library. The first is up top in the header. You can simply click on to where it says video library. Or if you scroll down the page, you will see the larger video library section. And once you click into this video library, this is what you will see. We have the search function up top, so you can type in keywords, VitoDens 100 wiring, um, control interface, basic programming, and the videos will populate. We do have the recorded online seminars section from the drop down menu, which is where this seminar will lie. And because it's specifically on the VitoDens 100, we also will have it in the VitoDens 100 B1XA section as well. So feel free to go back in about two weeks. This will be posted and view it again or check out all of our other videos we have on the 100 and all of the other boilers as well. We will also be posting this to our YouTube channel. So if you go to youtube.com, type in these North America, our page will populate and you'll be able to view this seminar and any other videos we have on our YouTube channel. And with that being said, let's begin. Here is Jay Sheldon. Thanks, Miranda, and welcome everybody. Thank everybody for taking time out of their busy day because it is getting cold out there, or it is cold. And I know what it's like uh, at this time of the year, the phones don't stop ringing and uh, we just got to keep moving. So glad to see uh, a good turnout today. And uh, I will start with the wiring uh, today and then we'll get into the, uh, the programming of the control, uh, seeing that you have to know how to wire the boiler before you can program it, right? So we'll start with the uh, wiring today. All right, so uh, today we're gonna to be talking about the VitoDens 100, uh, HA model and the KA model. And uh, what you're gonna find with these two boilers here, uh, there's no difference as far as the heat exchanges go. Uh, they heat the water differently. That's about the only difference between these two boilers. A uh, couple of different programming changes, but you're gonna see with this boiler wiring and programming is uh, pretty uh, basic on these, this boiler here. Uh, as you'll see that this is more of an entry level uh, boiler but uh, getting uh, the quality of the upper boilers uh, with the heat exchanger. So it's just the controls basically that are different. Uh, so with that being said, we'll get started and uh, you'll find how easy these boilers are if you haven't found out already. Uh, I put a lot of these in. I actually have a, a wall hung model prior to this one, the uh, uh, 1B uh, prior to this model. So I have that one in here as well as their oil boiler. Uh, so whatever's cheaper I can switch to, so. That's the benefits of being in the business for so long. My oil boiler is 22 years old though. All right, so let's uh, go over what we're gonna be covering today. We're gonna uh, talk about all the requirements to wire in your Vito Dens HA and KA models. Uh, two devices that might enable your uh, boiler heating systems, uh, either an end switch, a thermostat, or even maybe your heating curves with constant circulation. 
Uh, two different ways of controlling uh, your hot water on the HA model, which is that's more for an indirect uh, model. And uh, choices on your uh, boiler temperature controls. So we'll talk about that and uh, as we go along. Uh, so I always like to joke around with this because uh, like I did say, uh, Miranda said in the beginning, I did start off in tech support. And after doing this uh, much longer than 30 years, I thought I knew quite a bit until I did go into tech support and uh, was very humble. Uh, so we'll talk about that as well. But uh, the funniest story was uh, we had one guy that didn't know there was two screws on the bottom. So he took a pair of uh, uh, a breaker bar and lifted up the cover off the top of the boiler and then the whole door could swing. So I always like to go over, there are two screws at uh, the bottom of our boilers uh, that you're going to loosen up the screws and then take those screws and let them fall down. They will stay up inside that cover, uh, but uh, you won't get that cover off until you get those screws out. Just to go over the inside of the uh, control, uh, when this boiler first came out, uh, it was set up for uh, European uh, uh, design as well, because these boilers do go over all over the world. Uh, so they do a lot of uh, what they call constant circulation. So in the beginning, uh, which you shouldn't see ever see again, because these boilers have been out a few years now. Uh, but uh, I leave it in the presentation. If you ever did get one uh, and the circulator wasn't shutting off, uh, they had put a, a jumper in there for it to run constant circulation on the inside of the cover. The other thing I always like to point out is if uh, you do uh, let the smoke out of the box or the genie out of the bottle, there is a spare fuse inside the, uh, the control at the top here. So you just uh, put a little screwdriver in that slot and that whole green cover lifts out and uh, you'll see your, your spare fuse uh, as well, uh, right above it. As you'll see with all our boilers, uh, there is a, a plug system. Uh, so all our wires are marked and numbered. So when you're taking in a pot, you know, like in the old days, I used to have to draw a wiring diagram the red wire goes here, the blue wire goes here, so I would remember. Uh, now everything's wired, numbered, uh, so if you're doing taking wires off anything or you're looking for something, uh, it is numbered, so it, it, it uh, and they're keyed, so you can only put them in the same spot. Outdoor sensors, five sensors do come with the boiler. Uh, we'll talk about that as well. And so let's talk about the spoiler itself as far as uh, wiring it goes. So you're gonna see it's, uh, you're gonna plug it into the wall basically. So a lot of times nowadays, we've got to put condensate pumps underneath these things. So uh, somehow you're gonna to have to get a plug up on the wall anyways for your condensate pump. Or if you're going into a floor drain, uh, you'll have to add a, a, a plug. Some states that I work in, they uh, require a GFI plug. Sometimes that's a more of a headache than anything else with those things, uh, but uh, they do require them. So let's talk about on our uh, 21 plug, uh, where you're gonna do all your uh, low voltage wiring for your outdoor sensor or an end switch. That's normally located on the inside of the cover here. So you can uh, pull two ears, you squeeze them, and the whole cover folds down. Uh, and then you'll see this white plug uh, actually screwed with one screw right in the uh, center of this here, right between the uh, two and three. Uh, you'll find a screw. I normally take that screw out so I can see the numbers because a lot of times you're looking at it kind of upside down. Uh, take the screw out, then you can see uh, your screws. Uh, and if you're at my age, you've got your glasses on trying to see them still anyways. Um, so th that's our X21 plug there. So your outdoor sensor is going to go to three and four, as you can see in the picture here. So your outdoor sensor, <clears throat> excuse me. By the way, this is the only boiler that we do have on our uh, market that uh, does not need an outdoor sensor. So you, you can put it in or take it out. All our other boilers require an outdoor sensor, whether you're using it or not. Uh, is this boiler here, you can program it out. So if you don't wanna do outdoor uh, temperature settings uh, and modulate the boiler and make it more efficient, uh, you don't have to. Um, and sometimes uh, that could be the case. Uh, but most of the time we're getting rebates for these boilers. So they wanna see the outdoor temperature sensor on it. And so these uh, outdoor sensor uh, temperatures will uh, run up and down the scale with a thermostat. So uh, you're still gonna modulate to the outdoor temperature according to your thermostat. Just be aware, I always like to point out that uh, your outdoor sensor does go to your Northwest side of your building. We wanna see that on the coldest side of the building. It does say 16 AWG there, if you can find it. Uh, a lot of times all you're gonna find nowadays is uh, 
18 gauge, uh, 16 gauge is getting more and more expensive, uh, but it will work on the 18 gauge. Uh, I always say just don't run it alongside of a uh, high voltage wiring. If you have to maybe use shielded cable, uh, so you're not getting any interference to your outdoor sensor. Very rare, but it does happen. My biggest thing I saw in tech support was where the locations were, putting it in the sunlight, putting it under a dry event, or even better, putting it under the vent uh, of the boiler, which uh, I tend to see a lot of that. Uh, just remember, hey, we got some temperature coming out of that food pipe. So it can fool the uh, outdoor sensor and thinking it's warmer than it actually is. So you're gonna go out there and try to figure out what's going on there. So a lot of times I start with that outdoor sensor and make sure it's in the right location. If anything, you can put it in the coldest spot of the, uh, the property that you can find, if you can get out there. That's what that plug looks like. And that's where you're gonna put your outdoor sensor on three and four. Let's talk about the thermostat location. Right next to that three and four, there's a one and two. So you can either do it uh, one of uh, three ways here. You can uh, run an end switch uh, from a control. This is a third party control here and they're just running an end switch. Has to be a dry contact switch. And they're running that over to one and two. This could be a multiple zone. This could be a seven zone controller if it can handle 125,000 or whatever BTUs uh, boiler you're using. Uh, so it can be a multiple zone control and you just send your XX over to TT uh, one and two. It can be just a thermostat and uh, just the thermostat alone to turn on uh, your uh, pump on your boiler. Uh, this boiler does uh, recommend uh, primary secondary, but uh, what I always talk about with this boiler here is you do not have to do primary and secondary. Say you have a really small apartment with small amount of baseboard in the apartment. Uh, you can run your thermostat directly to the boiler, use the pump in the boiler to do your heat as well. Uh, so if you, uh, I believe it's under 25 gallons of water complete. That's, uh, so that's including the water in your boiler, which there's about a gallon of water in this boiler and um, 25 feet of baseboard. I'm sorry, not uh, gallons, 25 feet of baseboard. But remember, it does have to be a dry contact. Uh, the newer Nest uh, I found will work on this boiler. Uh, they don't need the uh, common wire anymore to work. Uh, so the, the newer ones will work without a common wire as well. But you're gonna find our newer 100s are gonna come with R, W, and uh, C on the newer boilers coming out uh, within the next year or so. Uh, they're just gonna change this a little bit, this boiler here and go up uh, a couple more sizes as well. So I think they're gonna go up to 199 on the newer 100s at uh, I believe uh, five GPMs on the uh, combi units. Uh, the other way you can do this as well is if you do wanna do low temperature and uh, do constant circulation, you would put that jumper on the uh, 96 and just modulate to the outdoor temperature and then set your room temperature set point on the control of the boiler, which we'll talk a little bit about that later on. Uh, for years, that's the way Wiesman uh, uh, has taught people about constant circulation because they do do that in Germany. Uh, so I actually, I, I tried this uh, 22 years ago and there are no thermostats in my house. I do have radiant in most of the rooms. Uh, so I have a couple of uh, mixing valves as well uh, and just set heating curves for each uh, mixing valve. Just remember, if you do not use your outdoor sensor, and this is on any of our boilers, you don't get the cold weather protection. So this boiler will maintain a certain temperature, 68 degrees on the boiler, if the temperature drops out to uh, 41 degrees on this boiler here. Uh, so you get frost protection. So what that means is uh, as soon as it drops to that temperature outside, your boiler's always gonna maintain 68 degrees. That's on our 200, our 300 as well. If you don't use your outdoor sensor, you're not gonna have that type of protection. So I always put it as where if your system pumps fail, but your boiler's still heating, uh, your house is not gonna freeze, right? Uh, or your boiler's not gonna freeze. Your house might freeze, but your boiler might not. With the HA model, uh, the HA model is uh, heat only. 
but you're still using the uh, pump in the boiler to pump the water over to the indirect uh, tank because uh, there is a diverting valve in this. If you didn't see this boiler before, there's a diverting valve. So while you're making heat, that diverting valve is in the heat mode. And then as soon as it gets a call for domestic, that diverting valve diverts, and now the pump starts pumping over to the indirect tank. The cool thing with this here is you can do it either with an aquastat or our number five sensor. If we send you out and it's a new install and you get the number five sensor with the boiler, I do recommend even if it's not our tank, to throw that number five sensor in the well, you might have to add some heat paste uh, to the sensor to get a good uh, transfer. But our uh, Aquastat responds about five degrees faster than um, our sensor, I'm sorry, our sensor uh, responds about five degrees faster than the Aquastat. So it will respond faster on and off. If it's already there, you already got the setup there and you just wanna, um, Run that uh, Aquastat, uh, same thing. Uh, you, uh, uh, you're not gonna set your temperature on the boiler. Now you're gonna set the temperature on that Aquastat. In the HA model, there's two plugs. And uh, with the uh, number five domestic water sensor that we send out uh, with the boiler, uh, you're just gonna plug that into the number five connections there. Once we plug those in, uh, we're going to go into programming and let it know. It actually uh, will pick it up, but we'll still go in there and check it in our coding. You'll see there's only 15 codings in this whole boiler. Pretty simple to get to. We'll go over that in a few minutes here. If you're using the Aquastat, you're just going to cut those little red plugs off and then wire nut your thermostat wire to that and then bring it up over to your Aquastat. Pretty simple. And then you're just gonna let the uh, control know that you're using an Aquastat and not the sensor. So about the halfway point with the wiring, as you can see, there's not a heck of a lot of wiring in this boiler here. And please uh, make sure you come here and if you ha have questions, ask them. If I don't know, uh, there's plenty of people here that do, but uh, like I said, I've been putting these boilers in, uh, Wiesman's boilers in for quite some time now, since they've been in the country actually. And for those that logged in a bit late, there should be a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen where you can type in any of the questions you have. And with that, Jay, we don't have any questions currently, if you'd like to move on. All right, all right guys. As you can see, it's not a really complicated boiler, so uh, we'll move on here. So we're looking at the control itself here. So now you can see it's just a, a breakout of uh, the picture before we wire it up. So now you can see your number five wires over here, your plug that's gonna go into the wall, and then your number 21, X21 plug here, where you're gonna put your outdoor temperature sensor, as well as your end switch, or like I said earlier, you can just run your T-stat right over to the boiler. Just showing you just uh, different examples. And uh, on this one here, they added in uh, just another uh, end switch for my air handler. This uh, picture is in the uh, wiring diagram. So uh, a lot of guys uh, look at this and uh, don't realize what they're looking at because this is the oldest style of wiring and zone valves. Uh, not my favorite way. This is the way I started off. Now we've got zone controls, which is way easier to wire than doing it this way. And uh, I used to have to put a box on the wall, you know, the ceiling, put your 24 volt transformer or whatever, 70 VA, and wire that in and then wire your zone control and then wire all your wires. And a lot of times it looked kind of messy and or a lot of jobs I went to, I would have to rewire because it looked just like a big spider's web and uh, spaghetti on the ceiling. So I'm kind of a neat freak, uh, but they're showing you here in this picture a lot. I had this question asked quite a few times. What are they showing here? Well, they're showing you that you can power that 120 volt transformer from that control. Would I do it that way? Most likely not, but if it's already set up there, um, you can. But nowadays they have these uh, zone controls. Doesn't matter who you use anymore because they're all pretty similar now. 
Um, uh, they have priority on these things. They have non-priority. So uh, you can do them zone valves. You can do them circulators. Uh, so it uh, <clears throat> doesn't matter. It's just an easier, neater way of uh, making your job look nice, I think, uh, instead of having all these wires running to your zone valves and whatnot, where you can just run three wires from your zone valve right to the control board. Uh, your thermostats are also, and it's easy to troubleshoot, I find, as well. Just to let you know, uh, no flow, no go. So this is a flow switch on our boiler. As well as uh, the wiring, uh, here's our uh, fixed high limit, which goes off around 210 degrees. Just showing you some of our safeties on the boiler and how they get wired in. And believe it or not, all these have our, the number three sensor will have a number three on the wire. And um, same with the 47 plug and all the other sensors on the boiler, including the plugs going to the controls. Um, here's our fluid temperature sensor. So that's in your fluid uh, at the very top of the boiler. Uh, all these sensors are 10,000 K NTC. Uh, you might get that question, uh, you know, uh, can I use somebody else's sensor? As long as uh, it's a 10,000 K uh, thermistor and NTC, that's what you need to know because they have PTC, which works on temperature drop and, or uh, temperature rise uh, either way. So one works on temperature rise, one works on temperature drop, uh, but they're not always exactly alike. So if you can uh, use uh, mostly uh, the Beesman's uh, sensors because they could uh, vary a little bit from others. This one's always a little neat here. If you wanna figure out uh, where you're running uh, temperature wise, uh, return water is uh, normally about uh, 27 uh, degrees uh, higher than your food temperature, anywhere from nine to 27 degrees above your water return. You need to add a low water cutoff. Uh, normally uh, you can do it, uh, you can tie it, uh, break it up inside the control going to your uh, control board because it's a uh, L1, L2 and a uh, neutral and edge. So you can break it there or you can do it in the plug in the wall. And uh, you know, you're gonna plug these in the wall. Uh, so you can break it that way uh, if it's required. That flow switch is a lot of times is why I'm showing you that that is uh, our low water cutoff. It has been approved for a safety. And uh, if you do need a sheet showing your inspectors that uh, most of your reps will have that sheet of paper showing that that is a safety device. I know some uh, states still require a low water. I think in New York City, they require that as well. So that, uh, it's just showing you how to tie in your uh, low water cutoff. You just want to break the power going in. And as you can see that plug that goes into the wall, here's your plug here. So if you want to break into your L and power your low water and come back and power your control, uh, you can do it that way as well. As long as you get your wires inside the box, put the cover back on. There's a better uh, picture of your spear uh, fuse, live fuse, spear fuse. So it was pretty quick, the wiring. That's it on the wiring. Uh, so it was very quick and easy, simple boiler to wire, which I like about these boilers. They're great for apartments, uh, really small houses, maybe one, one and a half bathrooms. Um, I'm more of a storage tank type of person, but the commies have their places in small apartments as well. Uh, uh, once you get into more of a larger bathrooms, uh, two bathrooms, one and a half, maybe two bathrooms, I start to go to indirects. Oops, sorry. Remember, enable a boiler, we can use an end switch, we can use the thermostat, or we can do constant circulation. Constant circulation, what we're doing there is in the control. When I start to go over the control, I'll talk about it a little more. We have a thing there that, uh, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, Well, if it comes back to me, I, that's different. Uh, two methods of controlling your hot water are the aquastat as well as the uh, number five uh, domestic water sensor that we send out with the boiler. And then explain uh, the uh, boiler temperature controls. Uh, that's uh, either a fixed set point or uh, modulating to the outdoor temperature. So that's uh, it on the wiring. 
All right, looks like we do have a few questions, Jay. The first one is, do you have to program the outdoor sensor if you choose not to use it? What I found with the outdoor sensor, as soon as you unplug it and turn the boiler on and off, the outdoor sensor stops looking for it. You can go into coding, which you'll see in the, the next uh, slides that we have coming up. I'll show you how to take it out. Uh, it's pretty quick and easy. Uh, but what I found uh, working, because uh, normally we're in the lab wiring these boilers. When you guys come in, we go into the lab. I have everything disconnected and you throw everything together just to see how easy and quick it is. Does the B1HA have a built-in pump? Yes, it does. So the HA and the KA both have built-in pumps. So the only difference between the two is uh, the KA model diverts to a flat plate heat exchanger. So as soon as you open up your faucet, the boiler fires and starts heating up that flat plate heat, uh, heat exchanger and you get your hot water that way. On the KHA model, when, you, um, when the temperature of your indirect starts to drop, uh, I wanna say it's four to five degrees, that diverting valve will divert over and the pump will come on and start pumping water over to the indirect. So yeah, they both do have pumps inside it and they both can do, uh, like I said, uh, you can use that pump in the boiler as well for heating. All right, and the last question is, does the 100 series have a built-in low water cutoff? No, it does not. But uh, like I was saying earlier, the flow switch itself is considered our low water cutoff uh, or our safety device. Uh, no flow, no go with this boiler. Um, so, and this, by the way, is the only boiler that we do carry that will give you a fault if there's no flow. You, you actually get an OB fault, which you can uh, go on our academy where I did a bunch of um, videos, how-to videos on troubleshooting as well. And that's one of the faults I do cover. Uh, so uh, if you wanna see any other videos, uh, they're on that uh, academy about uh, troubleshooting as well. Great. And yes, that is on the video library that I spoke about in the beginning. And then we actually did have one more that came in. Can you remove an Aquaset from an existing DWT and put a number five sensor into the tank as well? Yes, I've done, I, I do it all the time as well. Um, just because I like the Aquaset because it re responds faster, I get less callbacks as far as not heating enough or you know, Aquaset's response slow sometimes. Uh, there are alcohol bulb and uh, Aquastat that heat up and expand, and that's what makes the switch. So if they start to get weak, you start to have to turn them up. So uh, the only thing I recommend if you do, and it's somebody else's tank and it's not our tank, what I used to have to do is um, I used the copper heat paste uh, just because I like it better than the silver heat paste because over time the silver heat paste gets hard as a rock and it's a pain to try to get Aquastats out of the boiler. So I used the copper one and I've had very good luck with that. And it just gives you, you know, you goop it in there and then it just gives you a much better heat transfer because our sensor is a little smaller than the well itself. Uh, so that way you get good heat transfer from the well to the Aquastat sensor. All right, and that is the last question if you'd like to move on. All right, great. Great questions, guys, keep them coming. So we'll talk about the uh, control, the interface, the symbols on the boiler a little bit. Um, so we're gonna talk about their buttons and their functions, the uh, control configuration codes. And like I said, there's a total of 15. You might uh, use maybe a total of three most times. Uh, using the outdoor sensor versus a set point and uh, accessing the fault history. So this boiler, if you didn't know, has uh, a fault history. So if Mrs. Jones goes down there and hits the um, reset button on the boiler and the boiler fires and you go out there and you ask Mrs. Jones uh, what fault did you have and I didn't notice or I didn't write it down, you can actually find what that fault was. So we'll go over that as well. So this is a touchscreen uh, control. So it's a lot different than the one I have in my basement and programming the, that one there was a pain. I, I'm not gonna lie. I had two dials on it. You had to do them in synchronicity and uh, hold your breath and then turn the page on the manual. 
to get it programmed. So much easier control to work on here. Uh, I like this one here. It's uh, pretty simple. So as you can see over here, this is all your different symbols that come up on the boiler. Uh, so this is your touch screen part here. The rest are just showing you what's going on with the boiler. So when this here is representing a house, what's going on inside the house. And if you have your outdoor temperature sensor, it's got what's going on outside of the house. We'll go over all these different symbols and what they mean as well as we continue on here. This your on and off button is that button on the far right. So that will turn off the boiler here or turn it on. So when you first initially start the boiler, you're gonna push this boy, uh, button in. Uh, your mode buttons, all your different configurations that you wanna to get to. Your up, down, left, right. I'm sorry, your up, down uh, to get to uh, other parts of what you're looking at or even to decrease your values of uh, your temperatures. Make sure anytime you make any type of changes, you hit OK to uh, so it saves it into the uh, system. And then that return arrow is to go back to the previous uh, screen that you're looking at. Uh, the R button is for hard lockout. Uh, so if you say you go off on your uh, limit, uh, that is a hard lockout. So you would have to fix the uh, problem as well as hit the reset. We do have soft lockouts there, so you would get uh, a lightning bolt a symbol in there as well. It would look like this here if you had a soft lockout. Soft lockouts, uh, say like your uh, outdoor sensor fails, that's a soft lockout, you'll get a lightning bolt. As soon as you fix the problem, that lightning bolt goes away, you don't have to hit the reset button. So that's the difference between a hard and a soft lockout. Symbols are the same on all our boilers going back as far as I've been putting them on. So if you're in the heating mode here and the radiator's up here on the screen, you know you're in the heat mode. And uh, same thing with your faucet. If your faucet's in the screen, you're in, uh, running for domestic. If that flame uh, is illuminated, that means your flame is on. Uh, we do give you a little uh, sight hole door, <laughs> but basically uh, all you can see with there is a glow. The flames really don't get big with these uh, power burners, uh, unlike uh, prior older burners that, that used to be power burners and you had a big flame shooting out the front. <clears throat> these barely come off the burner flange, uh, burner tube itself, so very small flames. Uh, right next to that burner flame is your firing uh, percentage. So you can do two things here with this uh, uh, percentage bar. It can tell you uh, what percentage you're firing at, at the time, if you're looking at it. So 20, 40, 60, 80, 100% of the firing rate. As well as when you first install a spoiler, they want you to do a low fire test and a high fire test. So in order to do that, uh, It'll be coming up here shortly, but uh, you're going to be uh, hitting uh, that mode button until serve or service is flashing. Once that is flashing, you're going to hit OK, and then you'll find that it will come up here and it will say off. And then you hit your up arrow and then it will put it to 20%. And then you can do your low fire test and then you hit your up arrow again until you get all your bars colored here and then you're at 100%, and then you can do your high fire test. Pretty simple stuff, you'll see. Remember soft and hard lockouts. Soft lockout is gonna be that lightning bolt. Hard uh, lockout's gonna be the lightning bolt and the R illuminated. And then over here, you can have Celsius or Fahrenheit uh, displayed on the screen. To enter any function, you're gonna hit that mode button. Once you hit that mode button, it's gonna start something flashing here, whether it be your radiator, your faucet, serve, eco, comfort, or comfy. Once you're on the one that you wanna uh, program or ch uh, not program, but change, uh, you're gonna hit okay, and, uh, hit the mode button and then hit your arrow until that uh, thing is flashing, serve, eco, or whatever, and then hit okay. And then that's gonna allow you to make the change once you get there. I like to talk about eco and comfort for a second here. Eco and comfort are for the uh, KA models. Remember that, that's the one where you're opening up your faucet, the uh, boiler fires, we heat up that flat plate heat exchanger and we start to make hot water. 
Uh, don't be confused because I had a lot of customers used to say, well, how come the water's not right there at the faucet as soon as I open up my faucet? When they hear on demand for some reason, uh, they think it's um, going to be right there at the faucet. All that's doing is fire. as soon as you open up the faucet, it's firing the boiler. You still got to clear out all that water in front of it and uh, till the heat gets there. So it's not an on demand, but so which leads me into eco and comfort. I left most of all my boilers in eco. Eco, as soon as you open up the faucet, the boiler fires and it starts heating that flat plate heat exchanger. It starts heating that flat plate heat exchanger within seconds. That It's already up to 150 degrees. So it, they heat up pretty quickly. Uh, comfort mode to me is like, uh, if we sent this boiler to England where they put all their boilers into the kitchen and usually within a couple of feet of their kitchen sink, that's when I would put it in comfort mode because what comfort mode is, is uh, comfort is uh, keeping that flat plate heat exchanger at a certain temperature all the time. So as soon as you open up the faucet, you've got hot water. Uh, so if you find that you uh, put that in comfort and you have a bathroom that's pretty far away, you might get a, a little shot of burst of cooler water in there just because the plate's already hot and then it's uh, going out and then the boiler fires and then you're heating up again. Very brief, but uh, you know the homeowner is going to notice that when they're in the shower. Serve, uh, like I was saying earlier, that's where you're going to do your flu test load. And then uh, finally, uh, Comfy, which is, stands for configuration. Uh, that's a password protected. Uh, first password to go into coding is going to be uh, number 12, uh, Joe Namus number. I like to say that I'm, you know, I did have Tom Brady uh, as a quarterback at one time, but uh, he's now somewhere else. So I'm still with uh, Joe Namath. So it's just way uh, these numbers trigger in my mind. That's all. If you have your favorite player, you can use as well. So once you get that 12 in there, it's going to allow you to get into coding. But we're going to go until Comfy is flashing, and we'll go over that in a second here. When you're doing uh, temperature controls, uh, when you're doing uh, no outdoor sensor and you're doing uh, just a fixed set, uh, set point, uh, all you're gonna see is the temperature inside the house. You're not gonna see any outdoor temperature over on what's going on in the outside of the house. Just remember if you're trying to achieve 179 degrees uh, out of this boiler here, uh, this boiler comes defaulted at uh, 158. So you will have to go into that and change that. And that's uh, basically going into the mode button until the radiator is flashing. Once that radiator is flashing, and then it allows you to change that uh, fixed set point, which we'll go over that as well. Excuse me. Um, if you're using the outdoor temperature, now you can see what's going on inside the house here and what the temperature is on the outside of the house. So when I first put mine in 20, two years ago and it had outdoor reset. And I was like, wow, this is cool. I can actually see the outdoor temperature on my boiler. So I was, you know, I, I, I was thought that was pretty cool coming from, you know, an oil tech and being in this business with rotary burners and things to that nature. Um, so state of the art equipment was uh, always fascinated me. And uh, I thought that was pretty cool. I could go and look at the temperature. Small things move small, small minds, they say. And then as far as uh, adjusting your temperature for your domestic hot water, you're going to hit that mode button until your faucet is flashing. That's where you're going to change your temperature of your domestic as well. Or you can see what the temperatures are set to. So as I was saying earlier, as you can see, this boiler comes defaulted at 158. Not sure why, because this is the first boiler that ever came in at 158. All the other boilers come in at 167. And the reason why they come in at 167 is that's cold in Germany. Uh, they cannot exceed 167 degrees. Uh, we're one of the only countries that want to see 180 because fuel's plentiful. But uh, just to figure your bill three times more than it is now. And that's why they have to become more creative uh, on their on their heating systems and, and to save fuel uh, money. Uh, I know I couldn't afford three times my fuel bill.
Once that's flashing, you hit OK, and then that allows you to change that as well. Just make sure when you're done, though, that you hit OK so it saves it, because you can go through all of that and not hit OK, and then don't go back and check, and then next thing you know, you're not getting up to a 170 where you need it, 180. Think same way for your uh, domestic, you're gonna tap uh, the mode button until uh, the faucet is flashing at you. Um, hit okay, and then hit your up or down arrow and make your adjustments on, on your temperatures. As far as getting into coding now, uh, you're gonna hit that mode button until once that mode uh, button uh, you hit that mode button, then you're gonna hit your arrows until Confi is flashing, which actually stands for configuration. And once you hit okay on that, uh, you'll see that um, number one will come up. Actually, you're gonna go, uh, a zero is gonna be up there and then you're gonna scroll up to number 12 and put that password in then, then hit okay. Then your very first coding number one will come up. So there's your very first code in the boiler. And I always like to talk about that one right there because a lot of guys didn't know that one uh, existed. That number one is for filling and venting the boiler. So they call, I call it a purge mode. So it helps you purge the air out of the heat exchanger. Remember, this is a radial heat exchanger, all one pipe that goes all the way from the front to the back. There's no separations, there's no head. It's like on your, on your Giannone. So this is one uh, complete heat exchanger. So it, what it does is it calls the pump on, it puts that diverting valve into the center position so you can purge your heat exchanger or your flat plate heat exchanger or your indirect as well. Uh, so uh, just remember number one is your purge mode uh, and to vent the boiler. So once you do that, you put in the purge mode, the pump comes on for 30 seconds, shuts off for 30 seconds, comes on for 30 seconds, shuts off for 30 seconds. It works great, awesome. I have you guys do it in the lab. And when I first uh, installed all these boilers and uh, got them filled, uh, I used the purge mode. It took about four gallons to completely get all the air out of the boiler. So I thought that was pretty good. As well as we give you a little bleeder key as, and a bleeder hose that comes with the boiler and for the very top micro bubbles. And what I found with that purge mode, there was very, very little uh, micro bubbles in there. So this is just a quick little video that's gonna show you how to get into coding, what I've, I've just been talking about. To enter system coding, Ensure the boiler control is powered on. At the home screen, press the mode button, then the up arrow until the word Confi flashes in the lower right hand corner of the display. Next press OK. PU0 will be displayed on the boiler control. Press the up arrow until you reach P12 and press OK. You have now entered system coding. So just a quick video. So you can see it's not too hard to get into coding here. It's pretty simple. So let's talk about our coding itself. So here we are at that number one coating at the very top of the boiler. So as you can see here, it says filling and it will terminate after 30 minutes. So uh, once uh, you see that zero uh, next to the one, you hit okay, that zero becomes highlighted. Hit your up arrow until one is in there, hit okay. And then there you go, your fill mode started. And then I, so the way uh, you set up the boiler, we give you the um, boiler drains on the left and the right of the boiler. 
I normally purge on the left-hand side of the boiler with a, a ball valve underneath that uh, boiler drain that we give you. Uh, and that purges the, the, the boiler pretty darn quick. Now it works really well. I, I, I was impressed with it myself. Uh, code number two, uh, reduce your maximum heating output. Uh, you, uh, the only uh, reason that you may wanna do that is, uh, and just remember any of your codes, if you change them, your delivery states on the right-hand side there, meaning that's your default, excuse me. Uh, so that's your default reading. So if uh, you change this in any reason at the, for the 94,000 BTU boiler, or the 125,000 BTU boiler. These are your maximum output, 63% and 84%, but that's actually 100% of these boilers. So just be aware of that. The only time I would really uh, do that is say you're having a gas issue uh, when it's going up to high fire, maybe the gas piping isn't big enough or they added something they shouldn't. Uh, and the boiler snuffing out once it starts to go to high fire, you can kind of reduce your uh, modulation range down your uh, uh, range down some and uh, get it to work until you can get back there and upgrade your gas piping. Um, but not too much, I wouldn't mess around with it much at all, really. Altitude setting, that's for you guys out there in the West Coast, above 5,000 feet. Uh, you would change that to different uh, numbers here, right there, you would put it to a six. And then one through five is do not adjust. So if you're above 5,000 feet, you put it to a six. It's all about your fan speed and the thinner air, uh, because remember these are negative gas valves. So we're pulling that, uh, the fans ramping up to pull the, the gas through that gas valve. So as you can see, uh, some of these you may not even uh, have to touch. Maybe your fill mode when you first install it, uh, altitude setting, uh, maybe if you're above that high, and then uh, you really don't have to, shouldn't have to reduce your maximum output. The only other thing that you may wanna have to adjust is uh, from natural gas to propane. So this boiler does come with a conversion kit. So you have to put the orifice in the gas valve. It's two, uh, you know, I, I give a class on that as well, but uh, there's two uh, Allen screws that take the gas valve off. Um, take the gas valve off, a little nipple that this rubber O-ring is on, and then you put the orifice inside that, put it back on, and then you're just gonna come into coating and let it know that you're working on LPG. So once you get into program, it's defaulted as you can see to a zero. You hit okay, put one in there, you're now converted that boiler to propane. Number six is a do not adjust, and number four is a do not adjust. They they are in the your uh, manual. I just don't put them here because they are a do not adjust. So why even take a look at them? But they are do not adjust. Number seven, the only time you're ever, ever gonna have to do number seven. So if you got this brand new boiler and took it out of the box and you went to number seven address, number seven, it wouldn't allow you to uh, make any changes. It comes defaulted as a one and you won't, it won't allow you to make that change. The only time you can change that parameter is when you change the control. So you get a, this control is what they call a universal control. So like say you have KAs and HAs out in the field, you only need to carry one control. So it handles both, both boilers. The only thing that you need to tell it is what uh, model you're working on and what size boiler are you working on. Once you do that, uh, you uh, say you're working on the Vito Dens uh, B1HA35, which is the 125,000 BTU boiler. You're gonna go into that parameter, change that one to a three, you're done. If you don't do that uh, and you have, uh, let's say a combi unit and, it, it, and or uh, an HA model with non-combi and you, it's programmed for a combi unit, it's gonna look for uh, the um, uh, flow sensors in the combi unit. So you will get a fault. So then you'll know oh, I didn't program it. So then you go in there and, and then uh, program it. So uh, that's the only time you'll touch that um, number seven uh, one there. So I thought that was pretty cool where you don't, you know, you only have to carry one control because controls sometimes will get wet or whatever. I've seen them get wet during annual maintenances. But the neat thing is, is it covers all the boilers. 
So pretty much here on this page here, might be two that you have to touch in uh, these coatings. So one in about five there, you may have to if you're doing propane. If you're not, pretty much all the ones you're adjusting is that number one. So it's just a quick video how to do uh, natural gas to propane. So just another quick video. Same music. Your fallen feet as to, uh, Before servicing the boiler, be sure to isolate any electrical, water, or gas connected to the unit. This is Moises, he's from our tech support. Uh, he also Loosen boiler lab cover retaining uh, screws. Academy as well. Very helpful guy. First, remove the fuel connection pipe. Be sure to retain the fuel connection pipe gasket. Next, remove two Torx head screws retaining the gas valve to the radial fan. Obtain the liquid propane gas orifice and black rubber seal from the fuel conversion kit. Install the orifice into the groove inside the new black rubber seal. Install the orifice into the gas valve. Ensure the correct orientation of the orifice. Secure the gas valve with two T25 torque screws. It actually slides on the nipple in the back of that gas valve. Install fuel connection pipe gasket sure that on and reconnect fuel connection pipe line. Hold that gas valve. Reconnect power cable to the gas valve. Open gas shutoff valve and test for leaks. Start the boiler. To enter system coating, ensure the boiler control is powered on. At the home screen, press the mode button, then the up arrow until the word Confi flashes in the lower right hand corner of the display. Next press OK. P0 will be displayed on the boiler control. Press the up arrow until you reach P12 and press OK. You have now entered system coding. Once in coding, use the up arrow to access address 5. Press the OK button and change the value from a 0 to a 1. Save the change with the OK button. Once the address is changed, back out of coding, you can now fire the boiler and perform a combustion analysis. Please ensure to apply all applicable labels to the boiler. Not sure if you watch, uh, noticed that in the video, video for the natural gas, there's no orifice in there. It's a pretty good size hole. Well, guess what happens if you don't put that orifice inside that uh, nice big hole and you run propane and have a messy boiler, I'll tell you that. <clears throat> so make sure you put that orifice in there. <clears throat> Excuse me. So let's get to the, the second half of our coding in the manual. And as you can see, here we go on number eight. <clears throat> so here's where you would go in there. And if uh, somebody had asked this question earlier, uh, whether you wanted uh, outdoor sensor or not, as you can see, it comes defaulted uh, with the outdoor sensor as a the, the default. So it's look, gonna look for it. Uh, if you don't put it in there, it's not gonna look for it. So it will stay uh, not connected. So you won't uh, get a fault. Uh, and like I said, uh, you can still go in there, change it to a one if you want to, but uh, if you put it in there and you realize, hey, I don't want it, you just uh, unwire it power the boiler on and off, and it will uh, not look for the outdoor sensor. I've noticed that on this boiler for quite some time now, because we do do this in the class as well. 
The next three things are things that you're most likely not going to uh, mess with at all. Uh, to me, this is uh, again going back to England where the button tone and your backlight display and your contrast lighting inside the kitchen. Maybe they don't want to see a light or they don't want to hear the button tones or whatever. Um, you can uh, turn them up and down. On number 12, uh, that's for the uh, KA model. Remember the combi unit, uh, eco or comfort. So it does come to fault it in that eco mode. If you want to put it in the comfort mode, uh, you can. Uh, the only time I found, uh, the other time I found that it might help a little bit is like uh, in really cold, cold area of uh, water coming in the house, really cold water coming in the house. <clears throat> it might help that issue a little bit. Um, as long as the bathroom, like I said, is a, a closer than far away. If you do want to put the boiler in uh, Celsius, the boiler does come uh, defaulted in Fahrenheit, you would go in there and change it to a zero. For the HA model only, now remember we talked about you could put our number five uh, domestic sensor in, which that's what it's going to look for or you can go uh, tie in your rack with that. So you're just gonna go into that address 14 and tell it that you're doing uh, an Aquastat. So you would hit okay and change that zero to a one. Now it's looking for an Aquastat. And just remember that controller on the front of the boiler where you're gonna uh, adjust your temperatures of your water. Uh, no longer a playing effect on the uh, your domestic. You remember you gotta go over to your Aquastat and turn your dial up and down. I do have getting that call before I where I'm adjusting uh, the temperature for my domestic on the boiler. It's not doing anything. Just remember an Aquastat has its own temperature control on it. So you're gonna do your temperature controlling by turning the dial on the Aquastat. And lastly, uh, our number 15 is our heating curves. So if you're doing any type of radiant or anything like that, uh, you can adjust heating curves. So now you can see at this boiler, at this uh, setting here, it comes defaulted at the 1.14, uh, uh, but for this boiler, for some reason, they didn't put a decimal point. So 14 is 1.4. And the reason why I like to talk about the 1.4 is remember I was talking about uh, code in Germany is 167 degrees. Well, at 1.4, you're pretty close to 167. So any type uh, of adjustments where you want to put your heating curve, remember it goes from 0 0.2, which would actually show here as 0 0.2, up to 3.4 or 34 in the, in the, on your screen itself when you're making that adjustment. Uh, 34, you're shooting up that scale pretty quick. So you go into those hotter temperatures pretty quick. So there's not gonna be a kind of a knocking curve on your heating curves. We'll talk about that for a second here. So about the halfway point of uh, programming. All right, we do have some questions, Jay. Um, some of them um, were noted that they were answered already through the videos and everything, but just to reiterate on some points. Yeah, so everybody um, can hear them. Absolutely. How long does the unit stay in one or purge mode? Uh, 30 minutes. Or you can take it out uh, just by going back to coding and take it out. Can the replacement control be adjusted more than once? Yes. So if you do make a mistake, it will allow you to, to change it to the right one. What is the little green gasket that comes with the conversion kit? It's just a spear. Uh, remember when he was taking the nut off the gas valve, uh, the supply line going over to the gas valve, he says not to lose that fiber washer they send you a, a spear one. So when you're going to put that office in, just in case you split it or crack it, uh, these gaskets will take a beat and believe me because uh, we had hundreds of guys taking these boilers apart. And uh, finally, after you know two or 300 times, they, they will get compressed. 
but they they held up pretty well. But that's why they just send you a spare one. So I always tell people if you're not using that office, just hang it inside the uh, the boiler because you'll have your spare gasket with you. Awesome. And the last one I think you actually went over with the video is the how do I get into the coding? Definitely uh, did cover that as well. Um, that video is on uh, online. So if you want to watch it again, uh, we have a, a separate video on how to just do that as well. Uh, yeah. We have we have a lot of neat little videos, uh, quick how to's. Uh, sometimes you're stuck on the job and you know, as we as we all know, uh, we get into troubleshooting. Sometime we get tunnel vision and tunnel vision. So, to me, these videos are a nice little break to help break that monotony away. And then they look at is showing me how to do it. So, pretty cool. As long as we have, uh, as the Germans say, Wi-Fi in the basement or Wi-Fi here in the U.S. Yes, absolutely. And on the last slide, the website will be on there as well. And when you go there, again, just to reiterate, it's in the video library. And if you go to the VitoDens 100B1XA section, you'll see all of the individual videos of everything that Jay is showing today in this presentation as well. And that's the last question, Jay, if you'd like to continue on. All right, great questions, guys. Keep them coming. And now one thing that he doesn't mention in that video, and I like to bring it up, is with that uh, conversion kit, they come with um, uh, a new uh, rating plate. So you want to put that new rating plate up there. Now it's running on propane. And then it comes with a couple of little yellow stickers for the next guy that comes, because uh, that way they can see these little yellow stickers that it's now converted to propane. Uh, I just like to throw that in because they do come with it as well. All right, let's get moving. So after entering uh, your password, and we're gonna be talking about heating curves a little bit here and now. And uh, remember that uh, it's the very last code that you're gonna go to uh, in coding, uh, number 15, and that's how to adjust your heating curves. So right now uh, we're gonna be adjusting your slopes. And uh, just remember, as I've been saying, it's defaulted at one uh, 14, but the, excuse me, that's 1.4. Same thing with a 0 0.2 is a 0 0.2. And just showing you uh, <clears throat> different uh, heating curves that you can have and uh, where you might wanna be for different emitters. So we'll talk about uh, emitters a little bit as well. I just had to raise my heating curve uh, yesterday to a 0 0.6, I was at a 0 0.4, but Somebody messed with my circulator and I found it on speed two. So that was interesting this morning. So let's talk about our heating curves and what they do for us. Uh, a lot of times nowadays, uh, especially in the areas that I've uh, installed boilers, they have some great rebates, the gas companies do, uh, in order to get the boilers more efficient. Uh, if we're not putting our outdoor sensor in, uh, we're not gonna make these boilers more efficient. Uh, we, these are what they call condensing boilers. So we want these boilers to condense, right? So we want that return water back, going back to the boiler as low as we can, usually under 140 degrees, right? To get that boiler to start to condense. A lot of times when I did put this boiler in, uh, when I first started putting wall homes in, I noticed that the basements were getting cold. That was the first calls I started getting was, uh, you took my heat maker out of the, the basement. Now my basement's cold. So some things you can consider is adding a little bit of heat into the basement, uh, toe kick heater, a base of baseboard, a rental radiator, whatever it may be, tie it into your return. So we're stripping a little more of that return water going into the uh, boiler. So we can get that boiler to condense so we can strip all the heat out of the boiler that we need. We're trying to get that condensation. So uh, for all that uh, condensate we're taking out of the boiler, we're stripping all more heat out of that before it leaves the boiler. So we're trying to catch all the latent heat that we possibly can before it leaves the boiler. That's what makes all these uh, wall hung boilers so efficient is the condensing of the boilers. If we're not condensing and we're not getting into a, yeah, we're gonna save money because we're, we're, we're uh, running on a lower gas uh, and things to that nature, but you can really get them, uh, some good savings uh, if you uh, do it as well. So let's talk about the heating curves. Uh, this is a chart right out of our manual. For some reason, uh, the 3.5 isn't up here. 
but uh, the seating curve on this boiler does go to 3.5. So as you can see, it will shoot up a lot quicker uh, where you're not gonna be running up and down the scale as much. Uh, you're just gonna get to these temperatures just faster. That's all, shooting faster. On the bottom is your outdoor temperature. I always say, don't get confused. Remember what you're looking at, Fahrenheit or Celsius. Same thing on your bot uh, on the bottom, uh, uh, Celsius and Fahrenheit. So for this example, and for this example, it's just an example, depending on what you wanna do for your heating curves, where you wanna be, what you need to heat. Uh, this example is gonna be for just a 1.0 heating curve, just so I can give you an idea how the heating curves kind of work. So with a 1.0 heating curve, um, what that means is uh, with our boilers, when it drops one degree outside, this now means that our boiler temperature will uh, go up one degree on the boiler. So as you uh, raise this up, say to a 2.0, drops one degree outside, now our boiler water temperature goes two degrees higher. So that's the way our heating curves uh, work uh, as far as temperature wise go. And then we'll run up and down the scale according to the outdoor temperature. Just remember once it gets uh, wherever you put your end scale, once we get to there and if it needs to be the highest temperature, it's gonna finally get there. So if you need that one, uh, 180, uh, you're gonna be up here about the 1.6 uh, area. And you still be able to fluctuate up and down the scale. So we'll just see how this works on different temperature days. Uh, so a minus four day, and this is an example, with a 1.0 heating curve on that uh, minus four day, we go up, follow that over. On that day, we're heating the house with 140 degree water temperature. As the temperature gets warmer outside, say on this one here is 23 degrees, we follow that up, follow it over. On that day, now we're heating the house with 122 degree water. And once we're up to about 50 degrees, uh, now with that day, we're heating the house with 95 degree water temperature. Uh, great for radiant. Uh, can kind of do this with baseboard as well, uh, as long as you have enough emitters in the house. So for that day, uh, for this uh, heating scale, we're anywhere between 70 and 140 degree water temperature uh, on the different temperature days. Let's look at our emitters and what we might want to set uh, our heating curves too, according to our emitters. This is right out of our manual. We have this in the manual. Uh, we just add color to it to kind of make it uh, to where you can see it better, but this is in the manual. Uh, so you can see on the, the left-hand side, it's showing you your emitters, uh, starting at the bottom, your low temp, like radiant floor heat, uh, slab. Uh, next one up would be radiators, uh, rental radiators high efficient fan coils. Uh, so that would be kind of like your medium temperatures and then your high temp like baseboard and things to that, uh, you would set to the higher heating curves. So now we can see on the right hand side with those A, B and C where we're gonna start, uh, where you can start on those type of emitters. So on the A, uh, we're looking at lower temperatures. So anywhere from uh, 0 0.2, to 0 0.8. And I'm normally around uh, the 0 0.4, 0 0.6 in my house. Uh, so you can see what I'm heating the house with or the temperatures uh, with uh, in floor heat. Uh, B, same thing. So now we're starting to look at your medium temperatures and then C, your higher outputs. And uh, do you have to go to those high temperatures? It depends on the uh, how much baseboard you have in the house. We look at people's baseboard shots. We're not a baseboard manufacturer, but I am a contractor. And, and here in Massachusetts, I was always programmed to uh, figure out my baseboard uh, heat loss according to 180 degree water with zero outside. Well, if we look at their charts with that come with the baseboard, it goes down as low as 118 degrees. So you can heat baseboard, they're saying with their baseboard, you can go down to 118 deg uh, degrees and heat the house. But that's all according to your heat loss and how much footage of your baseboard do you need? Uh, do we uh, 
have enough wall space sometimes, uh, maybe not, but that uh, might be where you go to a rental radiator or, or even old cast iron radiators. I love old cast iron radiators. They work beautiful. Make them two pipe, um, hold temperature forever, and you can run them at much lower temperatures even than medium here. Uh, so uh, great uh, convectors. With radi we're, we're radiation, we're heating objects. We're not heating the air like we are with baseboard. Uh, I've done a lot of baseboard with outdoor heating curves and I uh, let them have their thermostat, but I set my room temperature set point on the boiler a um, little lower uh, than the uh, thermostat on the wall. So I can get a little run, uh, longer run cycles. I have them turn up uh, their thermostats up a couple of degrees higher. So you can get uh, run cycles, but we're kind of running off of that temperature uh, on the boiler itself. So it is possible to get longer run cycles and more comfort out of uh, baseboard. I've done it for years. Uh, so the first calls I started to get was my baseboard is not working. And I'm like, well, what's the matter? And I, I can't hear that ting tinging noise anymore. It's not making that ting tinging noise anymore. Or I can't smell the crayons and hair burning like I normally do when it first starts up. Uh, that's because we're running much lower temperatures. I would always ask, uh, what's your thermostat say? And they're saying, well, it's right there where I set it to. I said, are you comfortable? And then they usually would say, yeah, uh, why haven't we been doing this for a long time? Because it kind of gets rid of those spikes out of the uh, baseboard where it shoots up, then shoots down, shoots up. So you're hot, you're cold, you're hot and cold. If we can get longer run cycles, strip more of that heat out of the uh, temperature and get that boiler to condense, uh, your customers are going to love you, and I promise you that. Uh, I used to like to call my customers uh, within a couple of months, see how everything was working, and then I would call them at the end of the year to see what their fuel savings were. And it was just so I can say to my next customer, I can guarantee you uh, you can save 15% within five years of putting in this boiler, or whatever it may be. Uh, this boiler will pay itself off, and I could always guarantee within three to five years. The way let me set it up you can try it this way if you don't like it we can always change it so there's ways of getting around uh things because i did have to become very creative like i said when these boilers first came to the u.s their maximum temperature was 167 so try to put a boiler in a house that's uh, rated for 180 degrees and you're only going to get 167 degree water temperature out of there so things to consider so Here's your room temperature set point. <clears throat> so that's where I would use to set uh, the room temperature set point uh, a few degrees lower than their thermostat so I can get longer run cycles. It's going to look for to maintain 68 degrees and then have their thermostat at 70. And you, you'd be surprised how pretty close it gets. And um, it does work. So you can try it. And I used to tell, hey, you know, just try it for a little bit. I might have to come out and tweak it a little bit here and there, but your, your comfort levels are going to be much better. So on the 100s, this is your shift, what they call a shift up and down the scale. So you can get hotter temperatures by going up and colder temperatures at the lower end of the scale I'm talking about. Uh, and remember, if you do using this as well, um, this, uh, your thermostat is your warm weather shutdown on this boiler boiler. On the 200s and the 300s, if you're using it this way, uh, your uh, outdoor sensor is just shut off. And if you had it at 68, two degrees above your uh, room temperature set point is your warm weather shutdown. So here we go uh, with an indirect storage tank. And this is showing our 42 gallon stainless steel indirect, uh, great uh, indirect for the price. Uh, coils are second to none. If you ever seen the coils and are, they kind of have flat sides or pretty uh, beefy coils. And they go all the way down to the bottom. Uh, so you get a really great heat transfer and the flat spots on the, uh, the uh, coil on the inside uh, are to create turbulence. So we get the best heat transfer uh, going through that coil as possible instead of a round pipe where all your heat is on the inside uh, as well and not all that heat's just getting a free ride on the inside around through the pipe, where if we make turbulation, all that gets stirred up and now we get great uh, heat transfer. So Aquastat on your left here, uh, our number five sensor on the, on the right. And as you can see, it does come with that number five plug on it. We're gonna plug into that, uh, those two uh, number five red connectors inside the boiler and you're done. 
And like I was saying, if you're gonna put it in somebody else's indirect, I normally would put heat paste on this sensible uh, here and then uh, put some inside uh, the well itself. So we get good heat transfer from the wall to the, uh, the sensor itself. Same way as going into uh, uh, coding, uh, just going to scroll down to number 14 and let it know whether you're using the Aquastat or the sensor. So now you can see uh, when the, uh, your temperature sensor uh, will uh, come on uh, at 41 degrees for boiler uh, protection. And we'll maintain 68 degrees on the boiler even when there's no call for heat. So don't let that fool you and say, hey, why is the boiler running? Uh, it could be because it's in uh, cold water, uh, cold weather protection. So if you look over here and your outdoor is reading under 41 degrees, you know you're in cold weather protection. So if somebody calls you and says, hey, my, I heard my uh, boiler running and I know there's no call for heat, it could be that they're below 40 degrees outside. No sensor, no frost protection. The emissions test. So remember when uh, we install this boiler, we want to do an, uh, a low fire at 20% and a high fire at 100%. This is just showing you how to get into there. And once that service flashing, when you hit the mode button, you hit the arrow uh, until service flashing, then you hit okay. And this is what it looks like when you get to that screen, it says off. As soon as you hit your up arrow, we'll go to 20%. You'll see this first bar light up. And by the way, uh, I always tell people with our, either boiler here, say they have a gas fired uh, hot water heater down in the basement, those 57% efficient hot water heaters in the basement. You could put either one of these boilers in the basement and say, hey, by the way, down the road, you can add an indirect to this boiler or you have a flat plate heat exchanger in this boiler and all we got to do is turn it on. So just like this here, you can go in there and change, uh, shut your domestic right off and it will say off. You'll go into the domestic mode, turn your domestic off and then say, hey, down the road, if you want to put a, a more efficient indirect in there or if you want to use the combi part of this boiler when that fails, you're all ready to go. So a nice little way to get your uh, boiler in there and uh, they, they have this comfort to them. Same thing, uh, okay to shut it off, but uh, to go through, you can see it, you'll start with the uh, off and then you can put it into 20, 40, 60, 80, and 100%. Low fire, 20%, high fire, 100% on this test here. And just remember, as, as long as you're within the scales uh, that we're looking for, uh, you should be fine. Entering your fault history. Uh, this is pretty neat here as well. Uh, this wasn't even in the manual when this boiler first came out. We just stumbled upon it actually. Uh -huh. But anyways, uh, accessing the last top 10 faults is pretty neat because say uh, you get the phone call and the, I got no heat, but I went down there, I hit the reset button, the boiler fired. You get there and then you can come here and then you go into same way that you're gonna go into uh, coding and put that number 12 in there, you know, Joan Amos number, number 12. This time we're gonna put Fran Tarkenton's name in there. How's that one? Just a little joke there because most of you both not, might not remember him. But uh, number 10 is the password to get into your last top 10 faults. Once you do that, it'll come up and start with number one. So for this reason, uh, for this one here on that number one fault, was an F2. So on number one is gonna be your newest fault. Number 10 is gonna be your oldest. What I always say too, is when you first initially start up this boiler on this one model here, cause it doesn't give you the time and date of the faults. Before you leave on your new install, make sure you go into this and make sure you clear your faults. Cause we know a lot of times by purging gas or uh, 
purging the boiler, we might not get all the air out. So you might end up getting a fault on there. And we get onto the job, we see our first number fault. It could be a year old. Uh, so just clear it, make sure when you leave after you fix the problems, you clear it. So they, you start on a nice clear page, even though your newest fault will be number one. We just don't know when that came in. On the 200 and 300, they give you time and date that the calls come in. So over the controls, their functions, their buttons, the configuration, hey, this pretty simple uh, to program. I find it, uh, this boiler's here. I've worked on everybody's boiler, easy to program, easy to maintain, easy to service. And you can get to all the parts on this boiler without breaking your fingers and knuckles up uh, to get to things. So I find it, uh, Beesman uh, did a great job on their boilers. And by the way, in Germany, most of their technicians are Beesman technicians, so they go out to fix all their boilers as well. Uh, so, and uh, being a business owner myself, you wanna kind of get the guys in and out faster so you can get to the next job uh, in a quick, easy, safe manner. And uh, I think they did a great job as far as being able to service and get to all the parts in this boiler. The difference between an outdoor sensor and just a fixed set point. The only time I really, with this boiler here, might do a fixed set point is if I'm doing maybe hydrocoils and do a fixed set point there. <clears throat> and then uh, how to access your last top 10 faults. I think that's pretty cool as well. Uh, that way we know what the fault is. And uh, don't forget about on our, our, our website too, uh, we have uh, the fault code checker. So uh, on all our uh, faults, uh, you can put that right onto your phone uh, and have it there. Uh, so if you wanna access any of our faults, uh, on you go to our pro resources page and it will talk you into, I saved the whole pro resources page uh, page to my phone, uh, but you can uh, save just the fault code checker. You punch in uh, a fault into the fault code checker. We'll come up and give you a brief explanation of what's wrong. And then do you want to see the manual as well? So if there's no manual on site, there's ways of getting the manuals as well. So hopefully at the end here, you picked up a couple of tips to help you out uh, through our crazy life here in uh, boiler worlds and service and maintenance and all of that uh, at this time of the year. All right, we did have one question come through, Jay, um, in regards to the fault codes. How do you clear the fault codes out? Once you get to the fault codes, I'll go back here. It's uh, pretty easy. Once you get to that fault code page here, you hit the, uh, we have a video on this as well, don't I? Yeah, I make a is video? it in the access the fault code video, Jay? Yeah, it's in what there I'll as well. Is, um, I'll send it in the chat if you wanna pull up the chat and you wanna, um, I'll send sure, you the link great. right now. And I'll it's send it to everyone just so they have it. And you can pull it up and show that. Should be in that green, um, that green bar at the bottom. This one. Yep, and then just go to more. That's orange. Ah. Yeah, the chat right there. Perfect. Thank you, Miranda. You're welcome. I can fix boilers, but I can't do that stuff. Well, that's why you have me. <laughs> go up with our up arrow. All right, this is. We can now see that we've had it. Let me get up. So this is to show you how to take the clear those faults and how to access it. So it's, it's Hi, and welcome to Wiesman's Academy Training Lab. Today we're going to look how to retrieve the last top 10 faults or faults on your code history on the B1HA100 Vito Dens. It's a very simple, easy, quick thing. Sometimes the homeowner might press the reset button before you get there. We might not know what the fault is when we get there. So there's a quick, easy way to check. So all we're gonna do is uh, grab our stylus pen, if you have one. I use a stylus because my fingers sometimes wander to the wrong buttons. So we're gonna start by hitting the mode button. 
until confi or configuration is flashing down here on the bottom. So we're gonna do that by hitting the arrows. And now you can see confi is flashing. Once that's flashing there, we're gonna hit okay. And now we're into uh, password mode or programming. So we're gonna go up to uh, password for this one here is number 10. Once we get to 10, make sure you hit okay. And now we're at our fault history. And as you can see, our fault history, starting with the fault number one, is the newest fault, is a 38. If we go up with our up arrow, we can now see that we've had an OB fault. And uh, a lot of these faults, we do have videos that you can go watch to see how to fix those type of faults. And these could have been prior faults that nobody cleared before they left. And our last one here, we have another one, uh, an F2 fault. And that seems to be all the faults we have on this boiler. So a lot of times when we're in training, I tell people, make sure before you leave, after you fix the problem, go in there and make sure that all your fault history has been cleared. That way for the next person that comes on the job, they don't see these faults because with this boiler here, you don't see uh, the time and date that it happened like you would on our 200. So all we're gonna do on this boiler here is we're gonna press and hold the R button. And you'll see all the faults uh, clear. We go to number one, as you can see here, we have zero, zero. So now we know all our faults have been cleared. So we fix the problem. We go in here, clear your faults, especially after your new installs, because sometimes we create a bunch of different faults like that OB is a flow issue, or it could be that they had error on a new installation, but they never went back and cleared the fault on the boiler. So make sure now that all the faults are cleared before you left, you fix the problem. We start with a uh, clean, fresh page. We just uh, back out of here and go to a main screen. So now we're back to the main screen. You can see that our boiler water temperature is about 122 here, and our outdoor temperature for today is 70 degrees. This concludes how to retrieve your last top 10 faults and how to clear them. Thanks for joining us here at the Wiesman Academy Training Lab. Hope to see you here soon enough to create your own faults and fix them there yourself. Have a great day. So pretty quick and simple, just hold that R button. You still got to go into program and see them. But basically, you're just going to hold that R button down and uh, you're done. Sorry about that, guys oh. and gals. All right. Well, hopefully that answered your questions. If uh, you do think of any of your questions later on, please send them here to the Academy website here. And again, I want to pre uh, tell everybody thank you for joining us today. Uh, hopefully you picked up uh, one or two tips to help you uh, through our busy days today. And uh, thanks for joining us and come to our future ones as well. Uh, and it, it's a pleasure, it's been all mine. Thank you, Miranda. Thank you, Jay. Just a few reminders, like Jay said, our email is on the screen. Feel free to ask any questions to us. We'll get that spreadsheet out to you with all the questions and answers as soon as possible. A recording of today's seminar will be on that video library. We do have the wiesman-usacademy.com website up here as well. That's where that video library is. And you'll see all of the videos that were shown in today's presentation in this video library as well. So be sure to check those out. And if you haven't already, we do have a couple more seminars happening next week. Jay is back on Wednesday and Thursday, covering the wiring and control interface and programming for startup for the 200 on Wednesday and the CU3A on Thursday. And we have a venting strategies on the Tuesday with Jody Samuel. So if you haven't registered, feel free to go to our website and register at any time. They are the last seminars of the current year before the new year. And with that being said, that does conclude today's seminar. So thank you again for attending. Great questions today, and I hope you have a great rest of your Thursday. Thanks, everybody. Uh